welcome to this day one conversation. I'm Peter Wallace and with me today is the Reverend Dr. David J. Lowe's from Luther Seminary. David, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure, Peter. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Well, on top of everything else you're doing, you've also written an engaging new book about the Bible and helping us understand it. It's called Making Sense of Scripture. What was your purpose in writing that book? You know, I've written a few things and I've never been quite as excited about a project as this one. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians in mainline churches, if the statistics are accurate, do not uh, read the Bible regularly, uh, do not attend Bible study much, and, and feel kind of guilty about that, feel kind of bad about that, but don't feel like there are a lot of options. Um, and so what I tried to do in a very accessible um, conversational format, the, the chapters are structured around seven big questions about the Bible. What is the Bible? Is it true? Is it the Word of God? Where does it come from? How can I read it better? Uh, and then the, the, the chapters work themselves out in a conversation between two people talking this through. Um, so I've tried to both honor how important I think questions are, that sometimes we think questions or doubt or a lack of faith. And I think the exact opposite is true. The questioning heart and mind is the faithful heart and mind. Um, and sort of take that seriously and then offer an alternative to what I feel like are two bad choices, which is either on the right, where the Bible is this kind of uh, supernatural divine reference book. And a lot of people feel they have to sacrifice their thinking to buy into that, uh, or on the left, where it's just a book, it's the mm -hmm. sacred scriptures of a religion like all the sacred scriptures, and they feel like they have to sacrifice their faith. So what I've really tried to work out is, is to think about how can we approach scripture with our faith and our mind intact, and, uh, and we'll see. I'm, I'm excited about it. You mentioned you wrote the book in a conversational format. I would imagine you've had some conversations on these issues, but why did you choose to write it that way? Well, it, it is informed by years and years, all the way back to high school and college, of conversations around the Bible and biblical authority. Um, I really, I think there are some very uh, helpful, um, you know, I, <laughs> what I want to say are deep theological ideas, but <laughs> I have a hard time talking about my own ideas that's particularly deep, and they're not mine, they're the churches. Mm -hmm. I think there's some substantial theological claims but I want it to be eminently accessible. And I think we learn, every day, I think we learn the most through the conversations we have. Mm -hmm. And if we were to you go back even to formal settings of college or graduate school, we may be able to recall a couple of great lectures, but the conversations in the dorm room or the conversations in discussion or the Q&A, I think is where we actually appropriate the content and make it our own and work with it and question it and, and wonder about it. and, and it's in that dialogue where you begin to use it that it becomes real for you. And so I really wanted to write something that was both accessible and emulated that kind of learning. That it's not about simply me presenting ideas, but the reader has a chance to identify with the questioner to be part of that conversation and that way hopefully to be drawn more deeply into us into a sense of what the Bible holds for him or her. As you mentioned, you deal with some of the key questions. What is the Bible? Is it true? Where did it come from? And so forth. But one of the most difficult issues to deal with is how to really want to read the Bible. It can be an intimidating book. So how do we overcome that hesitancy in order to get more out of our Bibles? Mm -hmm. Well, I understand why people get nervous about picking up the Bible or wonder why they ought to pick up the Bible. It is, uh, it is unlike any other book you're going to read. Uh, I talk a lot about the Bible as story. Mm -hmm. It is unlike any other story you're going to read. There are so many different kinds of literature, from narratives that we're used to, long stories, to parables, uh, which we don't really have that many um, analogs for, to wisdom literature, to poetry, to love poetry, mm -hmm. to legal codes, to genealogies, to, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> this is... This is hard, even weird stuff, and it's all jumbled up in this collection. And so I think what really helps is a couple of simple frameworks about the Bible and the different kinds of literature. A little bit of background can help so that we understand what the difference between a parable is or a psalm or a mm -hmm. wisdom saying. 
um, I think some some basic tools about how to interpret scripture and and there's no way to to avoid it being a little bit challenging mm-hmm. but with just a little bit of, of preparation I think most people are amazed at how understandable scripture becomes and how relevant it becomes mm-hmm. and and as a parish pastor when we would uh, when I would teach these basic skills of biblical interpretation which we have not done pastors have not done a good job of passing on mm-hmm. People would get so fired up and excited about their own ability to see in Scripture depths of meaning that were absolutely mm. hidden before. So, you know, when you l- look at one of the really fun things to do is to hold two passages from the Gospels that tell the same scene but tell it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And instead of worrying about how do you reconcile and find the true account, ask instead, well, what's Matthew's intent by calling it a Sermon on the Mount? where Luke just talks about the Sermon on a Plain. Now, one way would be to say, well, Jesus must have offered the same sermon twice, and, you know, stop it. You know, what's Luke trying to say here? What's Matthew trying to say? Matthew's trying to offer Jesus as the heir to the tradition of Moses. And when just that little bit of information, then the reader reads that, and there's so much more richness there, and that's, that's really what I'm trying to cultivate. You also say it's good to question what you're reading and to ask questions and even voice your doubts. But how should we deal with those questions and doubts? What do we do with them? I do think naming them is really important. I think sometimes we think if we have questions and we just don't voice them, they'll go away. (laughs) And I think the opposite is true. I think silence gives doubt power. Um, And so as we name them, almost immediately we realize it's not something to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And only in naming them can can you be in conversation with someone about them, and, uh, and and you might not necessarily get an answer, but you are pulled back into relationship with the community of faith. I think about uh, Job, and the the conflict between Job and his three friends. Job has these profound questions, and they all think questioning is unfaithful, and God comes on the scene and does not actually give Job answers. Mm-hmm. but restores relationship mm-hmm. with Job. And then, in fact, turns to the other three and says, you did not question. And it sort of faults them for not having enough faith mm-hmm. to question the Lord as Job did. And I think we sort of have forgotten that somewhere along the way. You point out that everyone reads the Bible from a particular point of view. So, especially for those of us who may be somewhat familiar with the Bible, are there ways that we can approach the Bible with a more open mind? We may be surprised at what we find. Yeah, I think we can, uh, the phrase you use is really helpful, a more open mind. I don't think anyone can read the Bible or anything else with a completely open mind. I think that eludes us because part of the reason we come to Scripture is we have questions, we have insights, we come from a particular background. And that's what makes the Bible interesting to us. At the same time, if it's going to be a genuine dialogue, we can't simply read all of our prior convictions into Scripture. Mm-hmm. And so again, there's a, there are a few and simple tools or techniques or practices that anyone can learn uh, really quickly and easily that allow you both to name the questions you have, the presuppositions and convictions you bring, but also to create a little space for Scripture, sometimes to answer the question, sometimes to call the question into question, Mm. but to to make it an actual dialogue between you and and Scripture. David Lowe's, thank you for being with us. My great pleasure. Thank you.